Hi, this is the voice, Michael Shavello. You're listening to the Premium Odds Cast, hosted by leading MMA odds maker Nick Kalikas, fight scientist and author of Fightnomics, Reed Kuhn, and MMA journalist Brian Heminger. The absolute best UFC betting info, picks, statistics, and analysis from the most respected authority in mixed martial arts betting, MMAOddsBreaker.com. Welcome to the Premium Oddscast, presented by Five Dimes Sportsbook. I'm Brian Hemminger, joined today by leading mixed martial arts oddsmaker Nick Kalikas to break down this Saturday's UFC 211 event, which takes place in Dallas, Texas. If you're unfamiliar with our format, myself and Nick will break down the fight card from top to bottom, providing extensive analysis and a pick for each fight after doing our film study for the event. Looking back at our last event, we won 2.9 units after going 1-0 on our premium bet on Brandon Moreno. We also lost our one-unit free bet on Matt Schnell. Back to the present, UFC 211 features a 14-fight card in total and will be aired on UFC Fight Pass, FX, and Pay-Per-View this Saturday night. Let's dive right in. Now, kicking off the preliminary card on Fight Pass is a light heavyweight contest between Joachim Christensen, who is 14-4, and and Gadzimurad Antigulov, who is 19-4. and now, Nick, where did you open this fight, and how has the public shifted things so far? I opened Antigulov, minus 260, the comeback on Christensen at plus 180. Looking over to our sponsored sportsbook, FiveDimes.eu, the line is currently at Antigulov, minus 425, the comeback on Christensen is at plus 340. So needless to say, overall betting action has come in on the favorite Antigulov. A lot of respect he's getting out there from the betters, especially parlay-wise. Some straights, obviously, early on as well have caused the line increase here. His submission game is definitely off the charts. He is a very, very talented light heavyweight, even outside of the UFC, outside of his UFC debut, um, which was an impressive win. I mean, to me, I, I'm not a, a huge DeLima fan, so I, I think the guy has a lot of holes in his game, but he's definitely a dangerous opponent. So coming in and, and submitting a guy like that, to me, it's solid. I mean, it's a dangerous guy, and it's a, a good win. But you have to look beyond that fight and look back at what Andrew Gulov has done recently in his MMA career, again, outside of the UFC, some of the footage that's available. And he's been nothing but impressive. I mean, the guy is, is definitely a grappling-based fighter. He does have some KO power uh, with his right hand, especially. Um, and he has some speed to go with his boxing. He's, he's not really known for his boxing, but it's, it's not bad, the stand-up part of his game either it's getting better uh fight by fight and he's also got that submission skill that's pretty versed i mean he's he's not really uh one type of submission type of fighter he could get your neck he get your arm i mean he's well versed on the ground scrambles well um so he's uh, got all that going for him on the ground and on top of it his wrestling's actually not that bad either i believe in russia he was master of sport and wrestling too so that's a, a pretty decent accomplishment over there so he's got the total package i mean more of a grappling based fighter that can submit you with again a lot of different type of submissions uh but his stand up and his aggression is improved enough that he can even capable of beating you on the feet at times as well christensen on the other hand i think he's a very well-rounded fighter in his own right. I mean, he's longer and he's going to have that edge here. He's longer than most middleweights, or I should say light heavyweights, excuse me, um, in most cases as well. He's got that going for him. It was nice to see him pick up a win um, in his second fight in the UFC. So he's one and one right now. It was a solid win for him as well. It's, it's a big step up in competition here against Santa Gulov, considering he did get submitted in his UFC debut as well. It should be interesting to see how this one goes. But overall, Christensen, again, he has the length. He's got some decent striking skill. I think he's decent in the clinch as well. He's a tough guy. His cardio and conditioning at times looks like he's slowing but it's good enough to go three rounds strong as well and on the ground actually he has some underrated submission skill especially offensively so i don't think this is going to be a walk in the park especially where the betters have taken this line right now i mean Anton gulov being minus 425 i think is a little ridiculous to be honest with you and there probably is some value on christensen it's just tough to be confident though as far as the bet goes in this fight because again where the line is right now i do think Anton gulov probably ends up winning this fight, whether it's a close decision where he kind of grinds him out or he gets a submission. And I mean, I, I'm leaning a little bit more towards submission here for Antti Gulov, so I'm going to pick him to win. But I just think the the disrespect that Christensen's getting, especially after, you know, a, a pretty impressive but yet to be determined Antti Gulov in the UFC at least is kind of a head scratcher. So pick his Antti Gulov. We'll see how Christensen performs. And I'm not really sold on either guy. Christensen didn't look great in his UFC debut, and honestly, he didn't look great in his second UFC fight, although he did get a, a late finish and, and showcased a little bit of knockout power. Antigulov, we just didn't see enough of him. I mean, it was a nice performance, but uh, he's only spent one minute inside the octagon picking up that 
uh, submission victory. And it was a submission victory where he basically flopped to his back looking for a, a guillotine choke. Um, that's usually a low quality submission, uh, success rate. So, and a high risk one. So if he does that against Christensen and doesn't get it, he's going to be on his back eating shots. So that's definitely something we have to put into consideration. Now on the feet, Christensen should have a decent advantage here. He's got six inches in reach. He's a little bit more powerful. He's definitely more technical, but Antigulov, you know, he's not a fish out of the water on the feet. He can, he can throw his hands, but I don't expect him to have extended striking exchanges with Christensen because that's just not really his game. His game is he wants to close the distance. He wants to drag you to the floor and then he wants to work his Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I mean, he has a really strong grappling game and uh, whether he's in top position or a uh, sacrificing position to go for his submission. I mean, he, he goes for everything. So I expect Christensen to be on the defensive in the submission category repeatedly because Antigulov has some pretty good takedowns and a really solid ability to close that distance. But for some reason, if Antigulov is not able to get this fight to the floor, the, the window is there for Christensen to either win a decision by keeping the distance and just pitter-pattering with some uh, volume shots, or he could potentially knock Antigulov out. He does have that kind of power. But overall, I, I do like Antigulov. I think the grappling will be the biggest factor here, and Christensen was submitted in his UFC debut by a bit of a sneaky armbar in the second round. So I think Antigulov might be able to catch Christensen again. So I'm going to side with Antigulov. Now, dropping down to the featherweight division, we have Gabriel Benitez, who is 19 and 6, taking on Enrique Barzola, who is 13, 3 and 1. Now, Nick, what's the MMA odds maker's perspective on this one? I opened Benitez minus 185, a comeback on Barzola at plus 145. Early on the line did get bet up at five dimes, um, about two to one, maybe a little bit over for Benitez. As we get closer to fight time, it's starting to drop a little bit. Right now, over five dimes, it is currently Benitez minus 145, Barzola is plus 125. And that was actually recent movement too as well. There was a little bit of a drop here um, not too long ago with Barzola. So this is a tough one. I mean, Benitez has looked really good. Obviously, he's a well-rounded fighter. I think he deserves respect enough to be a favorite here in this matchup. And, man, I mean, to me, he keeps on getting better fight by fight, too. And he has a skill on the feet. He's got a sub submission skill to go along with it. Um, he's a very smart fighter, training, obviously, at a good camp with AKA as well. A lot of good things to like about Benitez, especially, I mean, his his will to win, his heart, everything about him. I mean, he's he's coming out strong, especially his striking, I think, has been really on par recently. So Benitez is a tough, tough out. But Barzola is going to be a tough out as well. I think Barzola is probably overall, in most cases, doesn't get as much respect. He's not as flashy. He's just more known as a grinder grappler um, that his stand up is improving a little bit. But it is improving quite a bit. I don't think a lot of people are realizing uh, the hard work that Barzola is putting in right now. And he's, of course, training with an American top team. I think that's really helped his game grow overall um, more than anything else as well. So his stand up in my opinion, is getting sharp. It's getting a lot more effective, and he can compete with some of these guys at 145 pounds on the feet now, where I think even on the show, it was still kind of a developing part of his game. Now, of course, it's still a work in progress, and I expect him to get better and better, but he, he, his striking's coming around, and he's more known for, again, his grinding style, and he's capable of getting the fight to the floor and staying out of submission problems and dropping some ground and pound and kind of grinding people out. And Benitez in the past, if people had success against him, has been putting him on his back, he has decent takedown defense, but he is vulnerable to being put on his back and controlled and kind of staying away from his guillotine choke and his submission. So I think Barzola is more than capable of kind of replicating that matchup style here against Benitez. So tough one for me. I think it's going to be a competitive battle, but I think the difference maker here is going to be Barzola's wrestling. I think he's going to be able to be competitive enough on the feet with Benitez, and he's going to eventually find some takedowns along the way, and he probably steals a very close competitive type of decision. So I'll go against the grain overall. It seems like most people are picking Benitez, and I'll pick Barzola to win this fight. Benitez definitely has talent. I mean, the kid can strike with some really top-notch strikers in the division. He's racked up some quality wins, and... He's he's definitely capable of winning this fight. It's just all about whether or not Barzola can kind of mix in the full uh, MMA game. Uh, Barzola, I think, is one of the more improved fighters from his appearance on The Ultimate Fighter. I mean, he was a guy that was basically a wrestler only 
when he won the show, and then he's steadily added uh, some excellent transitions, some striking. I really do think that Barzola is a guy that's on the rise in the division, even though he is uh, coming off of a, a bit of a tough loss against a, a top opponent. So what I think happens here, though, is Benitez should get the better of the stand-up exchanges, but Barzola will hold his own. I mean, I, I don't think that Benitez just blows him out. And then Barzola, I think the wrestling will be a big factor here. Barzola has uh pretty solid takedown accuracy. I mean, he gets in there and he takes down about 45% of his opponents. And Benitez only defends about 50% of takedowns. So, you know, that's telling you that Barzola, if he just keeps going after it, he's going to get those takedowns. And even though I think Benitez is improving in that department, I think Barzola can put him on his back, and I think that that could be the deciding factor in this fight. I'm not sure if I see a finish here, but I do think that Barzola can at least squeak out a close decision. So my pick is also going to be Enrique Barzola. Now moving all the way up to the heavyweight division, we have Chase Sherman, who is 9-3, and three, taking on UFC newcomer Rashad Coulter, who is 8-1. and one. Now, Nick, where did you open this fight, and how has the public shifted things so far? I open this one exactly. Pick a minus 120 either way. And right now, looking over five dimes, it is Sherman minus 145 to come back on Coulter at plus 125. To get up, bet up a little bit more than that for Sherman, now it's coming back down a little bit as well. It could be surprising to most, seeing that uh, a guy making a short-notice debut is actually competitive with somewhat of a UFC veteran. I mean, Sherman now has had two fights in the UFC, even though he hasn't won yet. He definitely has more experience, you know, than Coulter fighting better competition, especially in those two fights alone. I mean, I'm sure it was a, a good experience, win or lose for Sherman to kind of step up and, and compete against that high level of competition that he did compared to Coulter, which if you look at his resume, he's fought nothing but cans thus far. But I think Coulter is actually a little bit better than most people think. And I, that's exactly why I opened it. Obviously, a competitive line here. Coulter has a striking background, actually a boxing background. His hands are pretty nice. I mean, if you look at it, especially for the heavyweight division, he could definitely throw uh, some big punches. He puts together uh, his combinations well, keeps everything clean. He does look for takedowns at times as well, um, even though he's not really known for his ground skill at all. He doesn't have any submissions on his resume, and I think he, that's a weakness still in his game. He has to get better at defending some takedowns, and obviously his submission game needs to improve as well. But that being said, again, He's a really an athlete, a former college football player. He's training at a good camp. So this guy can definitely improve. And at age 35, it kind of doesn't sit well with me, of course. I mean, he's starting, obviously, to get to that point of his career where a lot of guys start thinking of retiring. But at 8-1 and one and against the level of competition that he's fought against, I don't think it's going to be a big issue. This guy's in pretty decent shape. In MMA years, fight years, actual fight years, he's younger than 35 as well. So I don't think it's going to be a big issue for him. Sherman, on the other hand... I think he's okay. I think he's one of these fighters that, again, before his UFC debut, his competition level wasn't really that high either. He was beaten up on a, guy, a lot of guys that he should have been beaten up on. Of course, training at a good camp, Sherman's been you know, putting some work in with Jackson's and crew over there. That's only going to help him uh, continue to, to get better fight by fight. Sherman's stand-up game isn't bad. He, he even mixes in some kicks well. He's a powerful guy. He does look for some ground and pound and takedowns at times as well. Not often enough, though. I think that's the key here for this fight. I think Sherman needs to kind of mix things up and actually be the more complete MMA fighter if he wants to beat a guy like Coulter. I think if it stays on the feet, Sherman can have a little bit of success, but I trust Coulter's chin a little bit more so than I do Sherman's at this point as well. So I don't think that's the way to go. I think Sherman wants to kind of slow this fight down a little bit, bully Coulter up against the cage if he can, maybe look for a takedown, get top position, drop some ground and pound or whatnot. That, that's his formula of success, I believe, in this fight, whereas Coulter basically wants to sprawl, brawl, keep it upright, and use that boxing to probably knock Sherman out. So this is a tough one for me. I guess the more complete game of Sherman – I'll lean with a little bit, but I wouldn't be surprised at all if Coulter ends up getting that knockout. Even, like I said, despite being a little bit of a short notice uh, fight for him. I think both these guys are going to be prepared for what they have to face. So it should be an interesting fight to say the least, but I'll lean a little bit more towards Sherman, just not a confident pick. And I'm going to come in on the side of Chase Sherman. I mean, Rashad Coulter, he's intriguing as a heavyweight prospect, but I mean, he's entering the UFC on short notes. On short notice at 35 years old, and overall, I just wasn't that impressed. As Nick mentioned, he really hasn't faced top-tier competition so far, but he does have some decent striking ability. So if Chase Sherman just gets into a pure stand-up slugfest, 
this gets interesting. I mean, I still think Sherman could win that type of fight, but I'm a little concerned about Sherman's chin now that he's been finished in back to back or that he's been beat up in one fight and then finished in another. So, uh, overall, uh, Sherman, I mean, he still has some potential. Uh, I know overall he, he's faced pretty good fighters in his UFC run so far, but, uh, the one thing he does have going for him is he's got a little bit of youth. I mean, he's eight years younger than Coulter. And I do think that if he can use some of that size and strength, then that could give him an edge. Coulter isn't very big. That's the one thing that Sherman does have going for him here. He is, he's a lot bigger. He's definitely a natural heavyweight. Coulter's a guy that used to be able to fight in the lower weight classes and he just bulked up a little bit. So, and now he's fighting at heavyweight. And I mean, if you actually go back and watch, you can actually see his, his one professional defeat was not in the heavyweight division. He ended up getting tapped out with a Kimura. So, um, if Sherman can mix things up here, use his size, bully Coulter a little bit, I think that there's a chance that he can win this fight without having to just resort to a, a brawl or a slugfest. And with Sherman's size and strength, I think that that will play a, a part in this fight. And if he can mix things up a little bit and, uh, and not just brawl, then I think Sherman does win this fight, but you do have to be cautious of Coulter's power. So I'm picking Sherman, but tentatively. Now dropping down to the featherweight division again, we have Jared Gordon, who is 12 and one taking on Mikel Quinones, who is eight and one. Now, Nick, what's the... What's the MMA odds makers perspective on this one? Up and Gordon minus 150 to come back on Quinone is at plus 110 right now looking over five dimes. It is currently Gordon at minus 150 to come back on Quinone is at plus 130. So line margins have tightened up a little bit. That's why you see the comeback a little bit different. And there has been two-way action on this fight as well. Tough fight. I mean, tough fight for both guys making their UFC debuts against each other because I think it's going to be an awesome matchup because both of these guys deserve to be on the roster. I think both of these guys have potential to win some fights in the UFC as well. Gordon's favored simply because he is the better all-around fighter, I think. Um, both these guys, again, have potential, but I think what you see so far out of Gordon, he was discovered by Dana White on one of his shows after um, he won the CFFC title, actually. So looking for a fight by Dana White, you know, the show that he, uh, Dana has, he's produced, he's brought over some decent fighters to the UFC off that show already. So it's, it's a good thing for sure. And Gordon's going to have some respect and recognition from it. But again, he's a very, has a very complete game, solid boxing with a little bit of KO power, solid takedown ability as well to go along with ground and pound in a submission game. So Gordon doesn't have many areas that he's really flawed upon. I mean, I think he, he can obviously improve a lot of those areas, but overall it's not bad what you see from him. And I think with him coming into the UFC still at age 28, he's going to continue to grow as a fighter. So a lot of good things I'm expecting from him in the future, but he's going to have his hands full, as I said, against Quinones here. Quinones is more of a striking base fighter. He's got good footwork, movement, excellent kickboxing skill overall. He's got KO power. So Gordon on the feet, even though he's capable of striking with people, he's going to have to be careful here because I think Quinones is the more dangerous and the better striker in this matchup. So, He's going to have to definitely uh, approach this fight with caution if he's going to sustain and bang with Quinones. Um, but Quinones does have some kryptonite in his game, and that, that is he needs to work on his takedown game. He needs to, a little bit more ground defense as well. I think, if anything, that's what I've seen flawed in his game. So that's why, again, Gordon has a better ground game, has a little bit better wrestling to go along with it, and that's why you see him favored here. I think this is going to be a barn burner. I think Quinones could very well pull off the upset. Maybe we're all underestimating him slightly, but as far as a pure pick goes, I think Gordon is a little bit of a better athlete. I think he's a little bit better overall, and I think I have to lean his way slightly, but it's tough. As far as a betting standpoint goes, this is a fight for both guys making their UFC debuts. I would probably sit back and watch and see how they perform because it is going to be a pretty fun fight. Jared Gordon's definitely one of the more interesting stories to enter the UFC in a while. And it's not just from the looking for a fight. He... There's some amazing profiles written about him, a pair of them actually, on MMA fighting. One was a couple years ago, and then one was more recent. But, I mean, this guy went from the, the lowest of lows, uh, being a heroin addict, almost actually having his heart stop a few times, um, 
just being just homeless on the streets and then overcoming that and becoming a really talented fighter. And he got to a nine and zero record. And then he lost to, to Jeff Lentz in a doctor stoppage when he uh, had his you know eye socket shattered and, and that actually got him to relapse because they put him on prescription painkillers and, and that just, you know, uh, just put him in a bad, bad road. Uh, and then he bounced back and, and here he is. He won three straight fights, won that title, and now he's getting a chance in the UFC. Gordon is a very well-rounded fighter. I think his stand-up is solid, but it's not quite up to Quinones' level, so he's going to have to rely on the rest of his game. And, and that's actually where Gordon is strong is he kind of is that jack-of-all-trades, master-of-none type where maybe if the stand-up isn't working, he can mix it up. He can go to the ground. He can um, mess around in the clinch a little bit. He's... Uh, a pretty well-rounded overall fighter, and I think that's definitely going to be a key factor in him winning this fight. Now, Quinones, on the other hand, very dangerous, a lot of power. Uh, I mean, if he catches Gordon with the, the right shot, he can put anybody out. So, uh, Quinones, I think Gordon really shouldn't spend a lot of time screwing around in the stand-up. Quinones is just a, a talented kickboxer that uses distance well, and as Nick mentioned, the kryptonite for him is... The, the ground. Um, Quinones is, is capable on the feet, but if you take him out of that element, you take away his biggest weapon by a landslide. He's not really a threat, whether it's offensively or defensively on the ground. So if Gordon can turn this into a full-on MMA fight, I think he's got a really good chance of winning it. And I think uh, him and his uh, very interesting story pick up a victory in both men's UFC debut. So my pick is going to be Jared Gordon. Now, moving on to the Fight Pass prelim headliner, we have a women's strawweight fight between Jessica Aguilar, who is 19-5, and five, and Courtney Casey, who is 6-3. and three. Now, Nick, where did you open this fight, and how was the public shift of things so far? Up in Aguilar, minus 180, the comeback on Casey, plus 140. Early action gobbled up the plus 140 on Casey and it's now actually Casey is a favorite minus 120 even money on Aguilar so basically pick him with a slight lean towards Casey and we'll see some action back and forth here for sure and it might even flip back to Aguilar as we get closer to fight day competitive fight for sure I think Aguilar being favored uh, slightly here makes a lot of sense to me I realize I, I think what we're seeing here with the action is she's coming back Aguilar is coming back from a torn ACL and she's been out for almost two years so realistically she's been one of the best girls at 115 pounds for a long time i mean she was ranked number one uh, she's faced high level competition she's such a well-rounded fighter i understand her ufc debut against Gadella didn't fare too well for her but that's I, in my opinion Gadella is the most talented lady at this weight class and i think despite joanna being the champion right now obviously i mean if Codella if had the cardio to go five rounds strong she would definitely be wearing that strap but credit joanna i'm not taking anything away from her that being said i don't think that loss to Godella for aguilar was that bad uh, i think she was at least competitive i expected it to kind of play out like it did a little bit and aguilar showed some life in that third round in my opinion that made me think, all right, she's not done yet. We can't stick a fork in her. I know she's been around this sport for a long time. She's 35 years old, I believe, right now as well. So she showed me enough in that fight that she belongs towards the top of the food chain at 115 pounds. Now, again, torn ACL has been out for a couple of years. So that that's definitely a concern. I mean, she could show up here looking like a very declined fighter if, if she doesn't have herself back in shape. But training at an American top team, I don't think she's going to come back out here not prepared, not feeling well. So I, I think she's going to end up performing OK. Now, Casey, on the other hand, you could say a lot of the same things. I mean, I've been nothing but impressed with Casey. I know what kind of skills she has. I mean, she's definitely a big girl for the weight class as far as height goes, as far as strength goes, for sure. And she has decent striking to go along with a really good aggressive submission game offensively at least on the ground as well so Casey's wrestling is not bad her takedown defense at times could let her down um, and she does need to work on that area of the game and then once she's on the ground if, if she has a, a girl that's capable of not getting submitted she can kind of get control in that aspect as well so I think we might see some of that actually from Aguilar here uh, depending on how the play, fight plays out a little bit but Casey to me even again 
like comparing the fights a little bit with Gadella, she showed me a lot in that fight. I actually gained a lot more respect with her losing that fight to Gadella than I did in some of her previous wins. So that was a good sign for me that Casey is improving. Her conditioning has always been a question mark in my mind in the past, but hanging with Gadella like she did there as well. And I mean, putting on a show, obviously Gadella won both of these fights clear, but these girls at least put on a respectful show is what I'm trying to get at here. So both of them have a common opponent that they performed, I think, pretty decent against despite losing. And I think it's going to be a good matchup here as well. I think we're going to see competitive battle back and forth. I'm going to go against the green here as well, though. I have to pick Aguilar. I think she's going to be the one consistently pushing the higher pace, at least, again, if we see the pre-torn ACL Aguilar show back up here and she's in decent shape. I think she's going to be pushing the pace. I think she's going to be a little bit more aggressive overall, and I think she's going to end up earning a, a decision win over Courtney Casey. So if that fighter does not show up, though, I wouldn't be surprised at all if Casey gets the win here. So this is another fight that you got to approach cautiously at the betting window. I understand some of you guys found value in that plus 140, so good luck to those who grab that number out there. But I still think Aguilar is probably going to disappoint most of those betters out there that took Casey. And if she has some life left, she's going to show up here and just kind of win a, a close competitive type of decision is what I'm expecting. So my pick is Aguilar. As Nick mentioned, my main concern is Jessica Aguilar's knee. I mean, it's been two years. She's been out of action for so long. And you just don't get better at 35 years old, especially in the lighter weight classes where speed and reflexes are so important. You just don't see a lot of people on the other side of 30 that are huge contenders at 135 pounds and lower. Now, uh, Jessica Aguilar, I would say... Three, four years ago, she could win this fight easy. I mean, that was when she was at her peak. She was the, the number one strawweight in the planet. But I think time started to pass her by. She's not really a huge threat on the feet in regards to power. Um, she does have a bit of decent technical striking ability, and she can hold her own in regular striking exchanges. But, but she, again, she's not a threat there. And then on the ground, yeah, her ground game is nasty, but she doesn't get a lot of opportunities to showcase it because uh, because of the injuries to her knees, she hasn't really she doesn't have that explosive takedown ability. She really only goes to the ground if people take her down, or if she can somehow close the distance and drag it to the ground. So overall, I just think Courtney Casey's going to be too big and too strong for her here. Casey's going to be uh, three inches taller. I think she's. I, I guarantee Casey comes in heavier than Aguilar, and. Uh, Casey's going to have about four inches in reach. And even though Casey isn't an amazing striker, she definitely has more power. If Casey can get top position, which, again, is scary because Aguilar's so good on the ground, Casey has some nasty ground and pound. So, I mean, that can... A, a black belt on the ground can turn into a blue belt real quick when they start getting hit in the head hard. And Casey could be doing that. And again, on the feet, I think Casey... Even though she's not an amazing striker, she might be able to do just enough here to just bully Aguilar a little bit on the feet. And maybe in the clinch as well, which I think it's going to give Casey a big advantage. And Nick mentioned that Aguilar, you know, she comes out of a great gym and uh, she'll be in shape. But, I mean, she's had times in the past where she did not show up in very good shape uh, for her fights out of ATT. Uh, she's missed weight a few times in the past, so like in Bellator. So I, I'm, I'm concerned with such a long layoff coming off a knee injury at 35 years old. I think the, the door is open here for Courtney Casey to pull off uh, a victory here against a, a solid veteran. So I'm going to pick Courtney Casey. Now moving on to the FX prelims in the lightweight division, we have Marco Polo Reyes, who is eight and three taking on James Vick, who is nine and one. Now, Nick, What's the MMA odds makers perspective on this one? I put Vic minus 275, the comeback on Reyes at plus 195. Wasn't quite high enough for Vic. Right now over five times, it's minus 425 for Vic. The comeback on Reyes is at plus 340. So needless to say, another spot where a three to one favorite basically gets bet up to a four to one favorite. And a lot of that is parlay action, some early straight bets as well. Overall community thinks that Vic is going to win this fight. He is definitely the more talented fighter out there. He, I think he has potential to wear the strap. I mean, with his skill set, with his just body type, everything, he has a lot going for him. I mean, he's still age 30, relatively young. 
skill wise, he has a good grappling background. I mean, he's got good wrestling, good takedown defense. He's got decent striking, a lot of good things going for him. I mean, he has all the ability in the world to, to be a tough matchup for anybody and make a run towards the UFC title at one point. I don't know if he's ever going to get there, but he has all the tools and, and potential to do so. But I don't agree with the, the betting action coming in so strong against Reyes. Reyes is a very dangerous guy and he continues to improve as well. I mean, he's been training with the Lions MMA and crew over there since the Ultimate Fighter show, and he's getting better every fight. If you watch his footage, the guy is improving by leaps and bounds. I mean, his takedown defense is actually getting pretty solid, and his striking has been pretty impressive. He's got good KO power, as we all always known that from him. That's been kind of the highlight for Reyes. But his KO power is still there, and he's cleaning up his technique a little bit. He mixes up his attack well. He pushes forward. He's a very aggressive fighter. So... That's why it's going to be a tough fight for Vic. I think in the past, if anything, Vic's kryptonite has been he's a little bit suspect with his defense, meaning that he gets he has a kind of we've said it before, tall man defense almost on a podcast or whatnot, where his offensively he's okay, utilizes that reach well, but defensively it seems like a lot of the taller fighters just can't guard their head well. You know what I mean? They get tagged or whatnot too, and Vic gets tagged a little bit too much for my liking as well um, throughout his UFC career. He's been rocked. He's actually been knocked out before in the past. I don't think – I'm not going to say he's got a suspect chin because it's not really fair to him, but – and I have noticed some improvement obviously You know, since he got knocked out. Uh, you know, He bounced back and had a very – Impressive win to say the least over Trujillo. Trujillo is a very dangerous fighter. In fact, there's a lot of similarities with Trujillo and Reyes as far as the ability to, to knock opponents out. I mean, they're both very dangerous strikers. So he ran through Trujillo, got an impressive win there. I think that kind of put him back on track for a lot of fans out there and they have faith in him. And his defense did look a lot better in that fight. So if he, if his defense is sound in this fight, I think Vic is going to look very good. I think he could even have a highlight real type of finish, whether it's on the feet or by submission. I mean, Vic's submission game offensively is pretty sneaky good. So he is a very talented fighter. I understand why people have faith in him. He's kind of a, a good social media guy too as well out there. He communicates a lot with the fans. So he has a good following, and that will only continue to improve, And if, especially if he gets a W here. But I just think it's a tough, tough matchup. So I have to pick Vic as far as a pure pick goes. But as far as a betting window goes, there probably is a little bit of value right now at Rye as a plus 340. I think it's insane really that the line got this to this point against a very aggressive, dangerous type of striker in Raya. So who knows? We could see Raya's go out there and get the job done as an underdog, or we could see Vic go out there and look, like I said, highlight real type of impressive win for him as well. So we'll see how it plays out here on Saturday, but overall my pick is going to be Vic. I think he is the better fighter. There's no question about that. I'm just concerned with laying that much juice on him with his chin and his defensive lack of defense, I should say at times as well. So the pick is Vic. Yeah, this is definitely a tricky fight. I mean, Reyes is on a nice little roll, winning three in a row. And I think, honestly, he's looked a little bit better every time we've seen him. But uh, James Vick is vulnerable. I mean, Vick, he's got the length. He's got the reach. He's got power. He's got a nasty, nasty submission game. But, man, his defense is so bad with his striking. The guy just, he kind of has that tall man defense where... He just kind of stays straight up, leaves his chin out, and if he gets hit, he can get hit hard. Uh, Vic has been able to rebound from getting clocked, and, and he bounces back, and, and he's tough. But, I mean, the one time he did lose, he lost bad. I mean, Darius just cleaned his clock. So that is one thing you got to be worried about. That being said, I'm not quite sure that Polo Reyes here is a Benil Darius level. I mean, Darius is a technical striker with nasty power, and uh, Reyes, he's he's a bit more of a brawler, and he does have power, but I don't know if Vic is going to get suckered into a brawl, and if he does, he might just use that as an opening to get this fight uh, closer and, and go for submissions. I mean, Vic bounced back nicely from the Darius loss with that uh, late submission against Abel Trujillo, and... I can see him doing the same thing here. As long as he doesn't get knocked out, uh, Vic should probably win. I mean, Vic has the reach, he has the size, and he has the ground ability that is always a threat at any moment. Uh, you just leave your neck anywhere, he's going to go for it. So I'm leaning with James Vic, but again, Polo Reyes, he does have the uh, a, a puncher's chance here, but I just don't quite think that'll be enough. Now, moving up to the middleweight division, we have Christoph Jotko, who is 19 and 1, taking on David Branch, who is 20 and 3. Now, Nick, 
Where did you open this fight? And how has the public shifted things so far? I put this exactly. Pick a minus 120 either way. 120 for Jotko, minus 120 for Branch. The UFC-based fans out there and betters come in on Jocko right away. I wasn't sure exactly how they would react because before his last fight and his, his impressive win over Lytus, I mean, Jocko got a decent amount of respect, but he wasn't really a target at the betting window for a lot of people. I think they just kind of more or less thought, eh, he's all right, but he's nothing special type of fighter. And now he's he's been pulling together some great wins. I mean, his, his win, his knockout win over uh, McCrory not long ago, followed up with an impressive win over Lytus. I mean, round one was close for, in that lightest fight, but uh, at the same time, he he did what he did, it had to do Jocko, and he looked very impressive as the fight went on and adapted pretty well. So that's a big win for him. I mean, Lightest took the champ at middleweight, obviously, we all know, Bisping to the limit. I mean, that fight was very close. So Jocko is at the top of the food chain for sure in the UFC middleweight division, and he only gets better fight by fight. And again, training with American top team, I think, has taken his game to another level, confidence-wise, training partners, everything about it across the board. That was a really good move for Jocko, and he's going to continue to get better fight by fight. Branch, on the other hand, though, man, I mean, the guy has looked good since he left the UFC and has been fighting outside of the UFC. The guy has obviously won two world titles in World Series of Fighting. So I understand some people might knock it. It's not UFC level. But the competition level overall in the World Series of Fighting isn't bad. So, again, he's not going to be competing with guys that are in their prime right now at UFC skill level. But he's going to be competing against high-level guys, at least about as high as you can get outside of the UFC right now in the World Series of Fighting. And he was able to, to get two straps, meaning the light heavyweight title and the middleweight title. So that's how confident in his skill he became. And and the confidence grew fight by fight. We saw that with Branch as well. He, he became a true champion outside of the UFC that I think the UFC wanted to sign back. I mean, they were anxious to probably get him back in the mix because of his what he was able to do outside of there. I mean, he's fought guys like he beat Okami, for example. Um, Clifford Starks, another UFC vet. Magalace, another UFC vet. So he's beaten some solid competition. I mean, again, those guys aren't still in the UFC, so it is what it is. But the way he's gone about it has been pretty impressive. So I think he has a game that could give Jocko a lot of problems here. This is a good matchup for him to come back to right away and see where he's at amongst the better fighters at at the middleweight division. But Branch has a decent stand-up game. His wrestling, I think, is what's going to come into play here. Even though Jocko has tremendous takedown defense, it's ridiculous how good this guy's takedown defense is getting. But as evident in the lightest fight and other fights as well, he can be put on his back. And Branch does have a pretty good double leg takedown. He times it well. And I think he could get opposition at times against Jocko here. But can he keep him down? That's going to be the question for me. So with all being said, I think it's a coin flip type of fight. I think it's going to be very close. I think Branch is overall going to struggle probably to get those takedowns. And I think Jocko is going to be able to control more against the cage. I think he's going to be able to control the striking aspect a little bit more as well. So I will lean with Jocko. I think I will go with... The overall opinion is it seems like the public coming in, the overall betting action coming in on Jocko. I think this is one where we're probably all thinking around the same lines, and I think it's going to be a competitive fight, but Jocko probably comes away with the win. You have to respect what Dave Branch was able to do outside the UFC with those winning those two belts and multiple weight classes. But the one thing I definitely am concerned about here is that him getting back into the UFC and they're immediately throwing him into the mix among the, the top 15. If he was getting a fight like against somebody in the, the middle of the pack, then I think that branch would have a, a much easier go of things, but against Christoph Jotko, I mean, he could be in some trouble. I mean, most people, they just remember Dave branch for being on the receiving end of one of the, the best, slam highlights of all time way back in the day. I think it was like UFC 116 or something. And now that he's back, I mean, they don't really know a lot about him. I, Nick reeled off the the who's who of who he's beat in the World Series of Fighting, but Branch's style hasn't really changed that much. I mean, this is a guy that wants to hold his own on the feet long enough to drag fights to the floor. And when he's on the ground in top position, he can be smothering, uh, whether he's uh, just riding you out from top position and dropping ground and pound, or if he's looking for submissions, um, looking to advance position to dominance. But for the most part, I mean, this is just a guy that wants to dominate you positionally and then look for those openings to get late finishes. Uh, I'm not sure if Jacques is going to give them to him. As Nick mentioned, his takedown defense is very good. It's actually almost 90%. That's almost unheard of. So 
Branch is going to have his work cut out for him trying to get this fight to the floor. And in the meantime, Jotko is going to be landing some nice strikes on the feet. I mean, this guy has some power. He knows what he's doing on the feet. He has some good technique. He has some pretty good volume. So if Branch doesn't get this fight to the floor, he's going to be in for a world of hurt. That being said, Jotko's lone UFC loss and his lone loss of his entire career, Magnus Seidenblad did catch him in a submission along the fence. So if Dave Branch can just close that distance, get him along the fence, and just find some sort of opening, that might be what he needs to do. Um, but overall, I'm going to side with Jotko. I think that uh, even though Branch is fighting at a high level right now, Jotko is fighting incredibly well. And he's a top 10 UFC middleweight, and I'm just not sure if Dave Branch is. So I'm going to side with Christoph Jotko. Now dropping again back down to the featherweight division, we have Chaz Skelly, who is 17-2, taking on Jason Knight, who is 19-2. Now, Nick, where did you open this fight, and how has the public shifted things so far? I opened Skelly minus 265, the comeback on Knight, plus 185. Another spot where the early action gobbled up all the plus money on Knight. A lot of fans believe that Knight's going to probably pull this fight off. Hard to argue from what we've seen of Knight lately. He's been more than impressive, to say the least. But I'm, I'm in a little bit of disagreement, although the line has dropped significantly. Right now, Skelly is at minus 130, and Knight is at plus 110. So I think we'll probably see Skelly bounce back up a little bit by fight day, but... Hard to say because right now, again, most of the action coming in from you guys out there that already bet the fight to the people that are thinking about betting the fight is going to kind of side with Knight as an underdog here, I think, overall. That seems to be the trend. I, th- I expect it to pretty much continue unless some heavy, sharp action come in, is, comes in Skelly's way, which I think is very possible, though, as, as well. So this is an intriguing fight. I mean, if you look at it, in my opinion, both guys is, have really improved pretty drastic as of late. I mean, Skelly, to me... He had all the tools again, I mean, to to make a big run at 145 pounds, but his conditioning and his fight IQ at times let him down. I mean, that's not what you want to see. Obviously, he's more well-known for his grappling-based fighting. I mean, he's a wrestler. He's able to get the fight to the ground in most occasions. He has a sneaky good sub game. And when I say that, I mean, his chokes are outstanding, and he's a smart fighter. Once he gets on, gets you on the ground, he takes your back. It's pretty much a wrap with Skelly. I mean, you have to have really good submission defense to, to fend him off a little bit, and a lot of fighters are not capable of doing so. So Skelly's a dominant ground fighter, but again, his conditioning and his fight IQ has just made him a guy that you kind of want to stay away from in the betting window. So I understand it, and I think that that's what we're seeing a lot of people bet Knight, because Knight, on the other hand, has been nothing but a warrior since he made his UFC debut. But we should mention that he made that debut against Kawajiri, an aging UFC veteran that it's not obviously in the UFC anymore. He's fighting over in Japan. Kawajiri is definitely a skilled fighter that will still win a lot of fights at 145 pounds. I'm not saying that even in the UFC division, but – he got taken down by a wrestler like Kawajiri. Skelly is kind of a similar style matchup. He's a little bit younger, though, than Kawajiri as Skelly is. And I think his stand-up game overall right now is better as well. So this is an intriguing matchup. But a lot of people, again, didn't hesitate to take that plus money. Um, Knight has looked very impressive outside of that Kawajiri loss in his debut. He beat Ehlers, which Ehlers is a pretty solid win for you, especially in your second fight. A lot of people were shocked at him uh, beating Hooker like he did. He, um, I think he won... You know, a, a pretty clean decision there against Hooker. And then, of course, his win over Caceres last time, I think, is what really put him on the map. It, it's surprising it sometimes because it, a lot of the fanfare out there seems to be kind of a hater with Bruce Leroy, uh, Alex Caceres at times. They don't respect his game, but a win over him it seems like a lot of people are definitely more on the uh, Knight bandwagon now than they ever have been. So Knight has performed well. His striking is something that you really got to keep an eye on because he's a fun fighter to watch. He's aggressive. He's accurate with his punches. He's got a little bit of pop in him as well. So he could definitely do some damage on the feet. He's got a good clinch game. But again, his kryptonite, I think, still, even though it's it's improving and it's, it's kind of hard to get him to the ground. And once he's on the ground and on his back, his rubber guard and his submission skill is pretty sick. So you got to be careful for sure. He's no easy out even on his back. But I think that's where Skelly can get him. I think Skelly can probably put him down on his back. He can control him. I think Skelly's good enough sub- defense-wise on the ground submission wise that he probably does not get subbed and controls most of this fight that's why i opened it over two to one for skelly i think his his wrestling and the stylistic matchup for him is pretty dominant now again stepping back a little bit saying his conditioning i think that we've seen an improvement in skelly's game he did switch camps you know he he obviously from team takedown he's he went over to uh henry hooften crew over there now and in his last fight i've never seen skelly look better i mean i realized that grootsmacher 
um, is a, a stylistic matchup that probably favors Skelly a little bit more so than Knight. But still, his conditioning was what, what I was looking at, and his improvement in the striking game was what I saw stick out the most for Skelly. And it, both areas looked really good. You could tell he his fight IQ was good. It just seems like a perfect fit. You know, he's training harder, he's training smarter, he's training better. He's he's getting his tools sharpened by the right people because his ground game again didn't need a lot of work. It was the rest of his game and his conditioning that really did. So I've seen that improvement. If the Skelly that showed up in his last fight against Grismacher shows up here against Knight, I think he's going to not make easy work of Knight, but I think he's going to win decisively enough that it won't even be a, a question mark who wins the fight if it hits the scorecards. But if the Skelly that shows up a couple fights back where he gasses after one round or so, yeah, that's definitely going to be an issue here. So I'm thinking that Skelly is going to keep the momentum, positive momentum going for him, and he's going to come into this fight in shape and ready to go. And if so, I think it's going to be a tough fight for Knight, but this should be a heck of a fight. I mean, stylistically, it's an intriguing matchup to say the least, but I am going to go against the public green here. And I think the Skelly probably does still have a little bit of value, to be honest, at the betting window. Minus 130. I mean, outside of, of him getting finished by Knight, I think he probably wins on the scorecards or even maybe even though Knight has decent sub defense, maybe Skelly could get that job done on the ground as well. So we'll see. I just got to favor Skelly here in this fight, though. Knight is definitely on the rise. I mean, after losing on that UFC debut, he's looked better and better every time we've seen him. He went from winning a split decision against Ehlers to winning a closer decision, but he definitely won that decision against Hooker. And then he just dominated Alex Caceres. I mean, that was a tremendous performance. And then he called out the the tops of the division. So they're giving him a, a fight that's going to decide whether or not he deserves to be a, a top 15 featherweight. Uh, now, Chaz Skelly is no joke. I mean, this guy... His only losses so far in the UFC are to Mirsad Bektik, one of the best featherweights on the planet, and to Darren Elkins, who took advantage of his conditioning issues. But it seems like those conditioning issues could be a thing of the past. So how this fight plays out, I think Knight does have the better overall Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu game, but Skelly is way physically stronger. Skelly has way better wrestling, and I think Skelly has way more power. Now, on the feet, Knight is going to be throwing at much higher volume, but he's a little wild and crazy, and Skelly could catch him with something nasty and clean. And with Knight being so aggressive, you're going to see a lot of openings for Skelly to get takedowns. And if Skelly has the confidence in his takedown game and then, and not to be worried about Knight getting transitions or submissions off of his back, then I can see Skelly riding out top position and looking for openings as Knight aggressively attacks him. And if Skelly gets a hold of something, he's going to squeeze and squeeze until Knight taps. So as impressed as I have been with the improvements in Jason Knight, I do think that uh, this is a, a winnable fight for Chaz Skelly, and he can either win a decision or potentially finish Jason Knight. So my pick is going to be Chaz Skelly. Now moving on to the main event of the preliminary card on FX, we have a lightweight bout between a former champion, Eddie Alvarez, who is 28 and 5, and Dustin Poirier, who is 21 and 5. Now, Nick, where did you open this fight, and how has the public shifted things so far? Up in Poirier, minus 140 to come back on Alvarez, even money. That was a surprise to most, because early action came in on Alvarez, and it flipped the line, and most of the action still is on Alvarez, but the line has flipped back now as we get closer to fight time because there is more two-way action obviously coming in on this fight as well. And now Poirier is at minus 130, which I agree Poirier being the slight favorite here. I know that's something to be said because Alvarez was just wearing that UFC strap not long ago. He lost to Conor McGregor. And outside of that, if you look overall at what he's been able to accomplish since he came into the UFC, it hasn't been bad. But if you look closer, I haven't been that impressed. I mean, Alvarez, for me, has always been one of the best fighters at lightweight. I mean, in the history of the lightweight division, I think he's going to be on the map for sure as being one of the all-time greats because of what he was able to accomplish. Obviously, before he came into the UFC, he's fought the who's who outside of the UFC, his style, his ability. I mean, everything that he brings to the table with Alvarez is fantastic, and he has some quality, quality wins. In fact, at one time, I thought he was the very best lightweight in the world. There's no, There wasn't a doubt about it. I mean, that's how good this guy got. But unfortunately for him, I think he came over to the UFC a little bit too late. Even though he had a run to the title and he actually won the title, which is great for him. I'm glad he got to wear that UFC strap. I mean, I think that basically completes his career. So whenever he de does decide to finally retire, he can be proud of what he's accomplished throughout his career. But again, I'm saying all this because I haven't been that impressed. I think that we see a declining version of Alvarez showing up into the, his UFC fights, even despite his wins. 
I mean, to me, that fight with Cerrone early on was a little competitive, but Cerrone ended up destroying him. The fight with Melendez, I give him credit for because he basically fought most of the fight with one eye, and he was able to pull off that win. But that was against a declining Melendez. Stylistically, the fight with Pettis, got to give him a little bit of credit. It was close, but he was able to wrestle Pettis a little bit there. And then the RDA fight, he caught RDA. You got to give him credit there as well. So, But I, don't, I still don't think he looked great in any fight that he's faced. I mean, any of these guys. He fought some of the top competition, was able to come out with a win. Against most, obviously, as we've seen there. But then he comes, shows up against Conor McGregor, and that was awful. I know that Conor is a really good fighter. I've even underestimated how good he really is in the past. But Eddie Alvarez is way better than he showed in that fight. I know there's a lot of pressure, a lot of things probably going into that with him. I mean, it's just a different type of fight feel across the board, even though he has all that experience for Alvarez. A lot of pressure that goes along with everything. So I'm sure he wasn't able to perform at his best anyway, but... With all that being said, I see spots of a decline. And with Poirier, I think Poirier is catching him at a good time. I mean, a couple of years ago, there's no question I'd be all over Eddie Alvarez because I do think he's the overall better fighter. I think he brings more to the table. I do have some question marks about Poirier as well, and part of that is his chin. He's been knocked out a couple times in his career already. He's been wobbled more than that as well. So Poirier does have a little bit of a, sus- a suspect chin at times, but he is a warrior. And I think recently, since he moved back up to the lightweight division, I mean, I know he had a setback with Michael Johnson there, um, and he had a pretty tough fight with Jim Miller recently as well. But outside of that, I think Poirier has looked better at lightweight. I think his chin has been a little bit better as well. Again, Michael Johnson can knock anybody out, so take that out of the equation because I think if Johnson fought Alvarez, that we could see the same result there as well. So it's just a different type of matchup, and I think I believe that Poirier can probably withstand Alvarez's striking. That's why I'm saying all this. At 155 pounds, I think his chin will hold up against Alvarez, and I think he's actually going to be doing more damage along the way. I don't think Alvarez is going to get him to the ground. I think Poirier is going to keep this fight up, sprawl, brawl, and probably do more damage on the feet. So I'm actually fairly confident with Poirier getting the win here, but only because, again, I see more of an upside. I've seen more improvements along the way for Poirier. He's 28 years old. I mean, even though in fight years, he definitely has – years beyond his actual age for sure i still think he's the fresher fighter out of the two with alvarez i just unfortunately i feel bad for alvarez i think he's going to probably end up hanging him up soon if he, if he gets a couple losses here in a row and i think this is going to be another one so i'm picking poirier to win and again i think i feel pretty confident that poirier probably finishes alvarez here if not i think he outpoints him and, and wins a three-round decision so my pick is poirier this is a tough fight to call for me i mean you have Two fighters with a lot of power on the feet that are talented strikers and well-rounded, and they both have susceptible chins. I mean, Alvarez is a fighter that seemingly gets hurt in every fight he's ever had, and he's coming off of, you know, a nasty uh, knockout slash TKO defeat to McGregor to lose his belt. And Poye, on the other hand, uh, when he's lost, he's lost in pretty violent fashion. I mean, Michael Johnson was able to, to clip him and take him out. And then uh, even further back, same thing with McGregor. When he fought him, he got clipped uh, with, a, with a winging hook and ju- did just enough to take out that equilibrium and, and finish the fight. So, uh, And Poirier is a guy that, that's been rocked in fights as well. So I, I don't think this is as one-sided as Nick does, but I am still leaning Dustin Poirier. I think it, it could be a bad matchup. I mean, Alvarez has some power, but you got to look at – the type of power these guys have. And when Poye hits people, I mean, it only, it only takes like one or two good shots and they're done. When Alvarez won the title from RDA, I mean, that had to take like 40 shots and that was after hurting him with the first one. So, I mean, if, if Dustin Poye had hit that same shot to hurt or stun Dos Santos or Dos Anjos, I think Poye could have finished that fight in about two or three more strikes if he'd have landed them clean enough. So, I mean, just overall, yeah, both of these guys can knock each other out. Both of these guys have powerful punching ability. But I'm just not sure Eddie Alvarez is trusting himself right now on the feet. Um, after spending most of his UFC career as a wrestler lately, and then just getting completely destroyed by Conor McGregor on the feet, he might come into this fight with a pure wrestling game plan, and if Poirier can stuff that, then I can see Poirier either winning a decision by just forcing Alvarez into a stand-up fight, and he's a bit gun-shy, or I can see Poirier connecting with something on the way in and knocking him out. So I'm going to side with Poirier, but if Alvarez chooses to stand, he could make things interesting. Now, moving up to the featherweight division, 
we have Frankie Edgar, who is 25 and 1, taking on Yair Rodriguez, who is 11 and 1. Now, Nick, where did you open this fight, and how has the public shifted things so far? Talk about a difficult line to set, honestly. I mean, you have a guy like Frankie Edgar, which is one of the all-time greats in the sports, surefire Hall of Famer. There's no question about that. Taking on the rising prospect that the UFC is really trying to push, and for a good reason. I mean, you see the potential Rodriguez definitely has. Tough one. Is he ready for the test of Edgar? A lot of people obviously think so, because I opened Edgar minus 260, the comeback on Rodriguez at plus 180, and right now looking over at Edgar, he's all the way down to minus 125. You're talking about Frankie Edgar over Yair Rodriguez at minus 125. The comeback on Rodriguez is plus 105. That's crazy to me in a way. I mean, Rodriguez, again, I do see the talent, the potential that he has, but this is a big, big step up in competition, I think. Edgar has been one of the smartest fighters. He's obviously one of the best wrestlers at 145 pounds, or at a, even at lightweight. When he was fighting at lightweight, obviously, he was one of the better wrestlers in that weight class as well. He's got speed. He's got power. He's got just everything, technical skill set. He's got submission ability on the ground. You can't catch the guy with the sub either. I mean, he, his sub defense is good. Defensively, he, he's got it all. I mean, Edgar, that's why he was one of the best. He pushes a high pace. This is a very difficult out, but everybody probably banking on the fact that Edgar is 35 years old. He hasn't looked the best recently. I mean, in my opinion, Edgar's fights have been a little bit disappointing at times. I mean, he's faced always going to face great competition. So that's the thing. I mean, we're judging him probably pretty strict. I mean, he faced Jeremy Stevens, even though I think he could have performed better in that fight in his last fight. Jeremy Stevens, always a dangerous fighter, as we know. And he ended up getting that nod. But before that, his fight against Aldo, he looked pretty flat to me. He didn't seem like the same Edgar. Aldo cruised to a, a pretty easy decision there. Um, and um, in my opinion, his fight against Faber, also, he didn't look that good. I mean, he won clearly. He he earned the nod, but I, I was expecting a little bit more of a dominant Frankie Edgar, I guess, in that fight, despite your eye favor being who he is. So to me, we could be seeing some signs of a decline from Frankie Edgar. And Rodriguez, Yair Rodriguez is one of these guys that, man, I mean, I, I just spoke about all his potential and his ability and what an unorthodox fighter he is. And he actually has some length to go along with that at 145 pounds. I mean, he's 5'11". He's going to have a little bit of a reach advantage, pure reach advantage as well. So he's obviously going to be taller than Frankie. He's going to have a pure reach advantage by at least a couple inches, I believe. Um, so that should come into play. And then his unorthodox striking ability and his skill overall, even on the ground, I mean, he's He's just an unorthodox fighter that isn't sloppy by doing so, though. That's the thing with Rodriguez. I mean, he does get overly aggressive at times, and it could lead to mistakes, but he's pretty clean with his skill set overall, and he's dangerous. I mean, on the feet, his striking, he probably does have an overall edge over Edgar. I think Edgar's the better boxer, obviously, in this spot, but I think Rodriguez, with his first kicking game, is going to probably present a lot of problems, and Edgar being a little bit shorter, I mean, that, that could come into play here. If he, if Rodriguez can keep him on the outside, use his kicking game, score a little bit more effectively, possibly catch that chin of Edgar, which we all know has, has been battle-tested time and time again. Even though it's held up pretty good, he's been rocked in the past. He's been wobbled. It's just his heart and his determination that has actually kept him um, never being KO'd. So you can't count that out either. You can't teach that. I mean, that's just the toughness of Frankie Edgar. So I could see this being a difficult fight if Edgar walks into some kicks, um, if he's not careful – on the feet, but I think what's going to happen here is Edgar takes Rodriguez down and he's not going to get submitted by Rodriguez once on the floor. I mean, Rodriguez does have a pretty dangerous slick guard. If he's able to reverse position on Edgar, I'll be a little bit surprised. Um, and, and we'll see what happens there. But overall, I think Edgar is going to probably stay out of sub trouble. He's probably going to be able to get the fight to the ground. And once on the ground, he's going to be able to do what he does best and just kind of either find his way to Rodriguez's back or just control enough, land some ground and pound to a clear kind of decision win. So we'll see. I know why this fight was made. Obviously, we all pretty much know Edgar is a declining champion that's going to be a heck of a win over an up-and-coming prospect like Rodriguez is, you know, on his resume. It's going to be a heck of a win. And a lot of UFC brass obviously thinks that he can get the job done here. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So one of those cases where I guess I wouldn't be shocked if Rodriguez is able to to stun Edgar and, and, you know, catch him and possibly beat him here. Or maybe he outpoints him in a very, very competitive decision. We'll see how that plays out as well. But I cannot pick against Edgar. I think Edgar, it's his fight to win or lose. And I still think he has a left enough left in the tank where he gets a job done against Rodriguez. So I think it's a little bit too soon for Rodriguez to, to get this kind of a leap in competition. But we'll see how it plays out. So my pick is Edgar. And call me crazy, but... I'm seeing this fight as a changing of the guard. I think the UFC is extremely high on Yair Rodriguez. And 
this might be a decent matchup for him. I mean, the main thing Edgar has going for him in this fight is his wrestling. And wrestling has kind of been his focus in his victories in the featherweight division, in his run to get that title shot against Aldo the second time. I thought Edgar was dominant with his wrestling. I mean, he was taking people down. He was beating them up. He was finishing them. I mean, it was an incredible run. But then Edgar went in there against Jose Aldo, and he just wasn't able to do the Frankie Edgar things. He was a step slow. He was getting caught with nasty kicks and jabs. He was just getting touched up for five straight rounds. It really, And he never had that comeback moment. And then he went out and took on Jeremy Stevens, and yeah, he was able to grind out a victory, but it wasn't a classic Frankie Edgar performance. He took a lot of damage in that fight. He almost got finished in that fight. I really do think at some point, Father Time has to get, has to win. He always wins. And this to me seems like the fight that Father Time finally gets his grasp on Frankie Edgar. I mean, Edgar is tough as nails, probably one of the toughest guys with the most heart of any fighter that I've ever seen inside the octagon. But he's 35 years old now, and he's taken on a young, hungry lion in Yer Rodriguez, who is 24 years old, and he is a monster. Uh, Rodriguez has that funky ground game, but that's not what I'm worried about here. It's the unorthodox stand-up. I mean, this guy throws the most spinning attacks you'll ever see, but, man, he's starting to really make them effective. I mean, it was probably one of the saddest fights I've ever seen in my life when he stepped in there against BJ Penn most recently. But, I mean, everybody was talking about how terrible BJ looked, but not enough people were talking about how amazing Rodriguez looked. I mean, he cleaned BJ's clock with head kicks, with punches, I mean, this guy is just a whirling tornado of violence. And if Frankie Edgar isn't able to kind of harness that and drag him to the floor and take that away, man, I just don't know if Edgar's going to actually have an answer for Rodriguez, pun intended. Rodriguez is so crazy on the feet that I just don't expect that uh, Edgar will be able to keep up with him. I mean, this is a guy that is so quick and so powerful and so fluid and his strikes can just come at all sorts of angles and they can come with devastating knockout power too. So I I really do think this could be the changing of the guard. And as long as Rodriguez can avoid being put on his back for extended periods of time, I can see him winning a decision here and I could potentially see him finishing Frankie Edgar being the first man to do it inside the octagon. So my pick is going to be yeah, Rodriguez. Now moving up to the welterweight division, we have Damian Maya, who is 24 and 6, taking on Jorge Masvidal, who is 32 and 11. Now, Nick, what's the MMA odds maker's perspective on this one? Man, what a crazy card this is. I mean, every fight we mentioned is just an outstanding matchup. And this is another one. Maya, I opened minus 175 to come back on Masvidal plus 135. It didn't quite work out. Again, another spot where the line shifted pretty decent. Right now, it's Masvidal actually favored in this spot, um, and the price is currently minus 130 for Masvidal. Maya's at plus 110, so all the early betting action coming in Masvidal's way. We're starting to see some buyback, obviously, on Maya at this point as well, so sportsbooks won't be in a bad spot. I think they'll continue to get two-way action here, but this is a tricky fight, and both of these guys, as Brian knows as well, have been pretty good to our wallets overall as a whole. I mean, for the last couple of years, because for somehow, some reason, they've been under the radar. I mean, just uh, we've been able to get great prices on these guys with, uh, depending on their matchups. So now they're facing each other, which is kind of a bummer in a way, because, I mean, again, both these guys I have – grown to love as far as uh, bringing in some cash for us as far as uh, the betting window goes because they, again, overperform at times. So matched up together, this is interesting. And it's going to be hard to see one of these guys lose being in both cash machines or whatnot. But that being said, I'm going to probably go against the grain here again with the public. A lot of people think that it's Masvidal's style 
his sprawl and brawl ability, obviously he's got a huge advantage on the feet. I mean, Masvidal is a nasty striker. He's got good takedown defense to go along with it. He's got good ground awareness overall as well. So Masvidal is a very complete fighter. And to me, he's been one of these guys that since he came to the UFC has elevated his game to a whole nother level, whether it's been the lightweight division or he's had success in, in the welterweight division as well. I mean, he's been around the sport for a long time. We were just talking about Eddie Alvarez you know, been around the sport for a while. Masvidal is another one of these guys that's been in the game for a long time. But to me, he still like he he still looks like he has a lot left in the tank. Um, even though he's been battle tested, been through wars throughout his career, he's in great shape. His chin holds up pretty well. Um, there's nothing really bad to say about Masvidal. So he's game everywhere the fight takes place. The guy can beat you. And again, he's been flying under the radar for a long time. So those of you guys that have faith in him and have been betting him, he's won you a lot of money recently. And he's the one that always says easy money. You know what I mean? He knows what's going on at the betting window as well. Uh, he's more than aware of the odds. I mean, and he delivers for fans that are betting him more times than not. He said it again this in this fight. I just don't see this fight really being easy money, though. I mean, I opened Maya the favorite for a reason. I think he should have a little bit of advantage. Now, of course, I did go back and forth on this fight a little bit because, again, styles make fights, and Masvidal does have a significant edge on the feet, but the edge that Maya has on the ground is pretty special as well. And, again, I think he is going to be the bigger, stronger fighter here as well. So strength-wise, I think he's going to have a little bit of an edge over Masvidal. Technical skill-wise, there's no question who the better grappler is here. It's Maya. Now, a lot of people will probably point to Maya's wrestling and say, hey, it's not that good. He's probably going to struggle getting Masvidal down. But the problem with Maya's wrestling is that it's so effective because he's unorthodox about doing so. I mean, he doesn't have to shoot a double leg and take you down. I mean, he could get you up against the cage at an angle and climb up your back and take your back that way. I mean, he has various ways, his trip takedowns. I mean, getting in close, he has a way to get you to the floor. If you look back at his footage, it doesn't matter. His wrestling might not be the best, but he finds a way to get the fight to the ground. And once he's on the ground with you, he gets most in most cases he gets the position he wants. If he wants to take your back, he takes your back, and then it's pretty much a wrap. Once he gets on your back, he'll take his time, be methodical with his submission game, and then look for that rear naked choke. And if he ends it, he ends it. If not, he's going to win rounds. So Maya is a very difficult out. I think it's going to be a difficult out for Masvidal here as well. It is tough because again, I could see Masvidal possibly finishing Maya, but I could also see Maya finishing Masvidal. Either no Masvidal is very aware on the ground and he knows what this matchup's about. Sometimes you just, I mean, guys like Maya, even though you know it's coming, you can't do nothing about it. So I think Masvidal is going to have to fight a near perfect fight to keep Maya off of taking his back or off of, you know, off the ground or whatnot. And I think he's going to probably struggle to do that. So especially as an underdog and, and everybody kind of losing faith on Damian Maya, which is legitly in my mind right now, the number one contender for the welterweight strap. He's taking a huge risk just taking this fight with Masvidal here. So hopefully he comes through because I'd like to see him get a title shot. Now that matchup, if it's Tyron Woodley, that's a whole nother story. That is an intriguing matchup to say the least. It's kind of a head scratcher there. But with all of that being said, I think Maya's probably going to get the job done one more time here. And Masvidal's probably going to lose some momentum, obviously, with the loss here. But he'll be okay. He'll rebound and, and come back and uh, start another streak here soon. That's how good the guy is. So I'm going to pick Maya. I'll go against the grain. I, I still have confidence. And I think there probably is some value at any dog price with Damian Maya. If you get him even money, plus money, I think there's some dog value there for sure. So my pick is Maya to win the fight. And I'm going to come in the other way. Maya, to me, is a very talented grappler, and he is using that grappling like we've never seen anyone use it before. I mean, he is going back to his roots. He's no longer trying to just be that well-rounded mixed martial artist, and we don't really have to see the the goofy, unorthodox striking that he was trying to do when he was trying to round out his game. Instead, he's just going to his roots, just going after people, closing the distance, wrapping them up, getting them to the ground, and then dominating them and either getting quick, fundamentally, technically perfect submissions, or he's riding out decisions. Um, that's what Maya's bread and butter is, and he's not going away from it here either. The problem is, I think Jorge Masvidal's takedown defense is excellent. His use of distance is spectacular. His footwork is great, and... I think he can just beat up Maya a little bit and avoid a lot of these striking and grappling exchanges. The main thing here is Maya needs to get a hold of Masvidal to get this fight to the floor and to get it to his realm. And Jorge Masvidal is so technically sound in that department, I'm not sure if he's going to let him get close enough. Um, I mean, it's not like typical 
takedowns where guys are just trying to shoot a power double or something. I mean, Maya, I mean, it's more, he just wraps you up and then there's just no way, nowhere to go but down. But I just think Jorge Masvidal is so slick on the feet and uses distance so well that he will be able to avoid a lot of these grappling exchanges. And if he can, Maya is extremely vulnerable on the feet. I mean, he could turn Maya into, you know, the a butt scooter or uh, somebody that just repeatedly flops to their back whenever they get in any danger whatsoever. I mean, if Ma- if Masvidal gets his game going the way I think it could be going, it could be like that fifth round of Maya against LaFleur where Maya was just exhausted, couldn't get takedowns anymore, and even had a point deducted for timidity. So... Uh, this fight is going to go one of two ways. Either Maya is going to get this fight to the floor and get his thing going, or Jorge Masvidal is going to beat Maya up and make him look terrible. Uh, but and, and I think Jorge Masvidal is going to be able to pull that off. So it's just a, a guessing game at this point to see whether he can stifle the takedowns. But uh, something in me is just telling me that it's Jorge Masvidal's time to shine right now, and Mas- and Maya might be vulnerable against somebody that is very well-rounded and has that ability to control distance. So my pick's going to be Jorge Masvidal. Now moving on to the co-main event of the evening, we have the women's 115-pound title on the line as champion Joanna Jungchecek, who is 13-0, takes on Jessica Andrade, who is 16-5. Now, Nick, where did you open this fight, and how has the public shifted things so far? Up in your J check minus 165 and the comeback on Andrade at plus 125. Right now it's Joanna Young J check at minus 150. The comeback on Andrade is plus 130. So line margins have tightened up a little bit. There has been two way action coming in on this fight as well. And there'll be continued to be two way action for sure. I mean, both these ladies are going to get a tremendous amount of respect. Andrade has for a long time, even at the bantamweight division. So at 115 pounds, she's definitely going to earn a lot of respect here as well, especially based on her performances. In my opinion, obviously we all know, I'll get into Joanna here in a second, but we all know what kind of champion she's been. It's been outstanding what she's been able to do, but Andrade is a legit threat. And since she dropped down to 115 pounds, I really like what I see. And I, most of us know, I mean, on the podcast, I picked against Andrade quite a few times you know throughout her career and of course i've won some i've lost some um you know betting or picking against or whatever whatever you may see um because i've seen some flaws in her game i mean a lot of it was conditioning i think her conditioning was definitely suspect at times her fight iq was suspect at times as well and i think that got her in trouble at times but uh, here at 115 pounds i think it's the right fit for her i mean her size she should have never probably been at 135 pounds i mean she's only five foot one she doesn't have a lot of reach she's used to fighting bigger way bigger fighter. So that's a good thing that she has coming into this fight too, because Joanna is definitely going to be the bigger fighter of the two. She's going to have some height and reach obviously over uh, Andrade, but I don't think it's going to be that bad for Andrade as far as, you know, adjusting and, and getting inside and uh, doing what she does best here against Jay check. But that being said, her win over Angela Hill really impressed me. I, I think that a lot of people underestimate how good Angela Hill can be. I understand she has some work to do on the ground still, and that's what could get her in trouble, but nobody outstruck Angela Hill in her career I mean, she's a very, very good striker like Andrade did in her last fight. So that showed me that 115 pounds, if she can strike with some of the better strikers at 115 pounds, she can have a lot of success because she's a powerhouse. She pushes a high pace. Her conditioning held up well. She obviously has some wrestling to go along with it too. She has a dangerous guillotine chick. There's just a lot of weapons in her arsenal for 115 pounds. And then turning it over to Young Jacek, the champion right now, I mean, she's been phenomenal as well. She's been, I mean, an all-time great, it seems like. Uh, 115 pounds, she's going to go down as one of the best fighters probably ever. One of, obviously, the first champion at a, uh, well, at 115 pounds. She wasn't, uh, I believe she got the title from Gadella, so or not Gadella, I'm sorry, from Esparza, so I take that back. She wasn't the first champion, but one of the early champions, at least, let's say that. Um, and she's been dominant. I mean, she, everybody they put in front of her, she's been able to dispose. Now, of course, in my opinion, the best fighter at 115 pounds, and I've said this, you know, on air a few times, is Gadella. I think she's the most talented fighter. And Gadella gave Janjacek a very tough run for her money. It's unfortunate for Gadella's cardio not being able to hold up because that's what got her the loss. I think she was cruising in her matchups against you, Jacek pretty good. And she just, uh, her cardio let her down and, and Joanna took advantage of that, which you got to credit her. She's a complete fighter. She can go five rounds and I don't think it's a knock on Joanna. I think that's, I mean, sometimes that's what you got to do. You got to last some of these aggressive fighters that might have you stylistically beat in a certain area. And she's done that. So she fits the bill as a champion very well. This is another five rounder. 
Um, I said that about Godella because I do – I mean I, I have a lot of respect. I think Godella is probably arguably the best three-round fighter at 115 pounds. So Andrade I think compares – Similar but different. Obviously, Godella's ground game is her best attribute, and Andrade is her striking game that's been really doing uh, wonders for her. But I think as far as a test for the champion here, I think Andrade presents a lot of problems similar to a lot of things Godella did. Now, again, on the feet, I think Andrade can put the pressure on her. She can land the harder shots. Jacek's a very good striker. We know that that's what her bread and butter is as well. She's able to sprawl brawl in most cases, keep the fight upright, utilizes that length well. Her combinations are clean, powerful. She pushes a high pace. She doesn't gas. I mean, that's again why she has a strap right now. Very tough out. But stylistically, if you look at it, Carolina or Carolina in her last fight was able to to have some success as the fight went on, especially later rounds. She actually um, was effective enough to hurt Joanna in that fight. And then you look back Claudia was able to as well. Laterno had a pretty competitive fight with her. So I think even though Joanna has looked amazing in most of her fights, she still shows me that she's vulnerable. And I think Andraja looks so good, and, and this is the right weight class, where I think that Andraja is actually going to have a lot of success against Jacek in this fight. And I think she's going to end up taking this fight. I think she could possibly finish Joanna in this fight as it goes, because that's the kind of pace and the kind of power and and just the kind of capabilities Andraja has in this fight. So – I know a lot of people are going to be scratching their head and can't believe I'm saying that, but I do think we're going to see and new um, after this fight is all said and done, and Andrade is going to come away with the strap. So we'll see how it all plays out, but I have to lean Andrade. I think there is obviously some value in the betting window here as well with Andrade being uh, the underdog because I think she's going to probably win this fight. So I wouldn't lay the juice the other way. Again, we'll see how it plays out. My pick is going to be officially Andrade. And I'm going to keep this a lot sweeter and simpler. The main thing here is, uh, I think Joanna Jacek is vulnerable. You've seen it a couple times now in her recent fights. She's been getting rocked. Um, maybe that chin is a bit susceptible. Uh, in the Gedalia fight, she got put on her keister by, uh, some strikes from Claudia Gedalia in the first couple rounds. And then most recently in uh, the Kovalkovich fight, she was, uh, stunned a bit in the later rounds and allowed uh, Kovalkiewicz to, to get back into the fight. So what's going to happen here? Um, I mean, she's facing someone in Jessica and Draj who has just been an absolute force since dropping down to the weight class. And Andraj, I mean, she just steamrolls people and she has no fear whatsoever. She is just a high volume, uh, frenetic pace and just gets right in your face and puts a lot of pressure and throws con- constant strikes. And it seems like her conditioning is as good as it's ever been. So what's going to happen here? I mean, young know, Jacek is going to have the reach. Her jab is going to be extremely important here. She is going to need to keep that jab in Andrade's face constantly. And, if she's not able to get that going, then I think Andrade is just going to be all over her, uh, aggressively pushing the pace and in her face and throwing a lot of strikes. Andrade's biggest weakness has been on the ground, but that's not really an area that Young Jacek is called a strength. Uh, Young Jacek's takedown defense is pretty good, uh, and she has a ton of heart, but man, I just... Unless she's able to knock Andrade out hard with some of those long straight punches as Andrade is on her way in, I just see Andrade putting the pressure on, pushing the pace, and just outworking young Jacek and wearing her down. And all it really takes is a couple big shots, and especially at this lower weight class where Andrade's power is amplified, I think there's a really good chance, and I agree with Nick, that uh, we could see... Uh, a new UFC champion. So I'm going to pick Jessica Andrade as well. So this brings us to the main event of the evening, the UFC heavyweight championship. We have Stipe Miocic, who is the champ at 16 and two overall. And he is rematching former champion, Junior Dos Santos, who is 18 and four. Now, Nick, what's the MMA odds makers perspective on this one? Another spot that's been bet pretty good. I opened Stipe Miocic, minus 245, the comeback on Junior Dos Santos at plus 175. Right now, looking over at five dimes, it is currently Stipe at minus 125. The comeback on JDS is at plus 105. So needless to say, the support and the love on JDS has come in strong. I get the fact that JDS 
won the first meeting between the two. Uh, I know in most cases, I think a lot of the betters out there and a lot of the diehard fans were still kind of questioning Stipe if he's how legit he is or not. I think he's answered those questions um, with his last few performances by far since he won the title actually over Verdum. I mean, the guy has been nothing but impressive. I mean, that fight he was fighting at that time, Verdum was obviously – the best heavyweight in the world. I mean, his win over Kane was just fantastic, and Verdum got himself to the highest level possible. Stipe was able to beat him there. And then his win over Overeem, to me, showed me the toughness. That, that's a hard, hard situation that Stipe was in. Defending your strap for the first time in your hometown, when you have all the backing of Cleveland, of Ohio, I mean, of the sports teams, the Indians, the Cavs, everybody surrounding him, I mean, the media that he had to do, all that stuff. There's a lot of pressure defending your belt for the first time, especially at home, and especially against one of the more dangerous opponents that you can have in Alistair Overeem. Stipe was able to take that pressure. He got caught early in that fight. He got dropped. He was put in some definitely a tough situation with that guillotine choke, and he was able to manage to get out of that. And then, of course, the rest is history with his how dominant he was to finish off that fight. And that just shows you the determination, the will, and the toughness that Stipe has to win that fight. Now, his ability on the feet, I think actually – is fantastic. I mean, he's one of the better strikers, better boxers in the heavyweight division. He's been for a while. I mean, he's got speed. He's got power. He's got accuracy. His conditioning at first, I was a little bit suspect on it, but he showed us now, I mean, through his UFC career that his conditioning is on par and he can go five rounds if needed as well. I mean, their first fight again, mentioning JDS, that was a five round war. Now, of course, Stipe did start to slow down in that fight a little bit. And I think if he would have put his foot on the gas a little bit more in round five, he probably would have won that fight. But since that time, he's had more experience. He's had, obviously, under his belt, he's gotten a chance to, to keep on working on that cardio, and his cardio has improved. I mean, we've seen a lot of, of good things from Stipe, so I don't think that's really going to be much of an issue here. I, for me, Stipe is the number one heavyweight in the world in the UFC right now by far. I, I don't think there's – I mean, obviously, there's people that can challenge him, but I don't think there's a question he's the best heavyweight on the roster right now. Now, JDS at one time was ahead of him, but I'm not sure if that's the time now. And again, that time was probably – when he won that fight or, you know, the Kane Velasquez days when Kane was champion and JDS was number two, of course. But for me, JDS just isn't the same fighter that he once was, that he, that he did fight Stipe not long ago. He's been in those wars with Kane and he's not getting any younger. He's been knocked out against Overeem uh, since that time as well. So that all doesn't sit well with me about JDS. I think that he's in that spot where I just can't trust his chin right now, even though he, he lasted – pretty well against Rothwell. I mean, he, he didn't have issues in that fight. He fought very sm smart. He looked good. Um, I give him credit for that fight, and Rothwell's a heavy hitter, so that's a dangerous opponent to have. But is not going to be as much of a punching bag as Rothwell was. Stipe's definitely going to be putting the pressure back on him, especially right now. I mean, that's the, the number one difference, I think, between the two from the first time they fought till now. JDS back then had the confidence because he knew he competed against the best in the world. He, he wore that strap before, so Stipe was kind of trying to get to his level. Well, now Stipe's kind of surpassed that level, and he's the better fighter of the two. So Stipe, that was a big test for him. He gained a lot of confidence despite losing that fight to JDS. He felt like he could belong, and it has, really has showed. So I think Stipe is the more confident fighter coming into this fight. He's going to look to finish this fight, and he probably does do so. So I trust him a little bit more despite the concern with him coming out last fight and, and defensively. It wasn't the best game plan in the world. I mean, again, shows his toughness, but you want to see him have better defense than he had against Overeem, of course, in this fight. But I think overall he's going to come out here. He's going to prove to the fans that he deserves to be champion. And I think I said it before in a podcast as well, that title defense streak with the UFC heavyweights not ever winning more than two fights or whatever, I think Stipe is going to break that streak. He's going to end up holding the title. He's going to win this fight and probably break it with his next fight as well. So he's the type of guy that I think can do it. And I'm a believer in him. I really do think, again, he's the best heavyweight in the world, and I think he proves it again by finishing JDS in this fight. I'm a huge fan of Steve Miocic. I mean, I'm a big fan of Cleveland sports. He's my Cleveland guy. He's he's my boy. But, man, I just think this is such a tough matchup for him. Um, you got to remember, when they fought the last time, Steve Miocic could not have been catching Junior Dos Santos at a better time in his entire career. I mean, I know Stipe hadn't quite ascended to that elite level yet, and this was kind of the fight that started it, but Dos Santos was coming off of, this was that, that was his first fight after the second Velasquez loss. I mean, Dos Santos had taken a beating, just basically 10 rounds of just getting the crap kicked out of him in those two losses to, to Velasquez. 
and and Stipe was ripe for the picking to to be able to get in there and and pull off a shocker. And it was a close fight, and Stipe, you know, performed well. It went all five rounds, but he just didn't quite take it to that next level. And, and it was pretty clear that Dos Santos had won the fight. Now, a couple years later, and Dos Santos, I mean, it, it seems like he's got his group back. I know he had that setback against Alistair Overeem, but, man, I thought he looked just like the Junior Dos Santos of old when he took on Ben Ben Rothwell. I know that Ben Rothwell is not exactly a, a top three or four heavyweight, but you know this is a guy that has picked up some quality finishes over some good fighters. I mean, Rothwell beat Alistair Overeem, Rothwell beat Josh Barnett, and Junior Dos Santos made him look silly. So if that version of Junior Dos Santos shows up, I think Stipe's in trouble. I mean, Stipe is a great fighter. He has heavy hands. He can go out there and rally a whole city around him. But I do think that his chin is a bit of a question mark. I mean, his last title defense against Overeem, the first punch that Overeem threw planted Stipe on his keister. And uh, that's something you have to definitely be concerned about. Now, I know Stipe has a lot of power in his hands. He came back. He won that fight. He knocked out Overeem with ground and pound. But uh, I think Junior Dos Santos has a much better chin than Overeem. And Junior Dos Santos has just as much power. So if they're getting into a, a boxing match, I think Dos Santos can win that fight. I mean, the last time that Stipe fought Dos Santos, he spent a lot of that fight in the clinch looking for takedowns that just were not coming. So... Does Stipe have the confidence to stand and trade with Dos Santos? And even if he does, does he have the skill to stand and trade with Dos Santos? I don't know. So I'm thinking that Junior might have Stipe's number. So I'm leaning a little bit more towards Dos Santos uh, recapturing that glory and defeating Stipe Miocic here in Dallas. So Mike is going to be Junior Dos Santos, and I think we might have two new UFC champions after Saturday night. So that'll do it for our full event breakdown for UFC 211. Our premium bets for the event will be released this Friday following the weigh-in, so pay attention to that via our Oddsbreaker Twitter. If we have a free play to give out, make sure to follow at MMAOB Premium on Twitter because that's where we'll post them first. We can also notify you of our free bets via email alert if you prefer that method. Just send an email to picks at MMAOddsbreaker.com and we'll add you to our free bet mailing list. Special thanks to our sponsor, Five Dimes Sportsbook. Good luck, everyone, and hopefully the betting gods are on your side this weekend.